Al Lower again. One frequently hears that black people did not only begin to arrive in Britain after the end of the Second World War. We are assured that, contrary to what most of us believe, there have been populations of black people, whole communities in fact, living in Britain since the time of the Romans. This is of course all nonsense, although Nobody likes to put the case so bluntly as a rule. It is easy enough to see the evidence, though, because photographs have been taken of crowds of random people in the streets of British cities since the end of the 19th century, and from about 1900 onwards there were also films taken of street scenes, crowds at sporting events and so on. What is immediately apparent is the complete lack of diversity seen in the population of this country up until the early 1940s. Every single face one sees in all the photographs and films is white. It really is as simple as that. Then too, we don't just have to rely on that visual evidence. Older people can fill in the years since the end of the war in 1945 and their memories, uh, things that accounts they've heard from their parents and grandparents, help to flesh out the rest of the century, the rest of the um, early 20th century and indeed the late 19th century. This supplements the um, evidence provided by photographs and films. For example, my grandmother on my mother's side remembered seeing Queen Victoria during the Jubilee and her memory of London ran unbroken from the 1890s to the 1970s. She had no particular reason to deceive anybody when she was reminiscing about her life. She did not see a single black person until the 1960s. In fact, I can remember her telling me about the first time she saw a black person I think this was 65, 66. In the parts of London where I myself grew up, there was not a single black person or anybody from the Indian subcontinent. Ilford was literally 100% white British, with a small number of Polish people and, of course, a Jewish community. Almost the whole of Britain was like that except for a few small pockets of black communities. They weren't even really communities, I should say small pockets of places where black people lived. And all of them had arrived since the late 1940s. That was the case through the 50s and 60s. There really is not the least doubt about this, and the simple truth is that there were no black communities in Britain before that time, before the 1950s. There may have been a few sailors coming and going in parts of port cities like London, Liverpool and Cardiff, but there were certainly no settled communities. So in the, the aftermath of the First World War, there were riots, uh, race riots in Liverpool and um, other places. These involved black sailors, so usually single men, living in particular areas of those ports. They were not black communities as we understand them. In the same way, Indian students came here to study medicine and law, but they were single men and almost all returned to their own countries when once they qualified. I have to say I am not passing a judgment on whether this was a good thing or a bad, nor that it was a better situation at the exceedingly diverse society which we now see. Um, but it was assuredly how things were. In other words, I'm not saying whether it's an improvement, whether it was better then or better now. I'm saying that that was the situation, that until the 1940s, Britain was 100% white, with a few tiny exceptions. This, of course, prompts us to ask, why is there such determination to create a false narrative of the past? 
to invent a world where large numbers of black people have always been part of history in this country? The answer is, I suppose, it's a cover story to excuse the fact that they effectively arrived here uninvited over the last 75 years and then settled here. Now the aim is to persuade us that our memories are at fault and that they have been here all along, which we all know is a complete falsehood. There may have been a few odd black people, Indians and Chinese people scattered here and there in the 16th, 17th and 18th century, but they numbered in tiny, tiny amounts, dozens or scores, not communities of them. Almost all were single men. For example, in the early 19th century, I've been uh, looking at this book called uh, it's The Black Curriculum, and it's for children, it's places important sites in black British history. Now, they mention here a black guy, an illiterate former slave called John Edmonston, who lived in Edinburgh. Let me just find a bit about him. It's quite amusing. Here we are, John Edmonston. He earned a living by stuffing animals and birds. The Victorians were keen on things like that to decorate their homes with. Let me look at a few of the lies here related to children to indoctrinate them in false history. Where are we now? You may not have heard this name before, but without John Edmonston, Charles Darwin might not have developed his theory of evolution. The point is that Darwin took a few lessons from this fellow in uh, taxidermy, how to stuff birds, which came in handy when he was on his travels. It says here, this was important because it helped Darwin study the birds and develop his theory of evolution. This is completely mad. John Edmonston's story is amazing especially because we don't often hear about the brilliant black British science that shaped history. You may regard the ability to stuff animals as brilliant science, brilliant British science that shaped history. Most of us would hesitate to describe it in those terms. I might mention also that earlier on in the book there's um, a few classic things. Beachy head lady, the first black Briton known to us was a woman of sub-Saharan African descent. Well, no, actually she came from Cyprus, but never mind. And then we have here, troops from North Africa built Hadrian's Wall. <laughs> as early as the Roman Empire, there have been Africans in Scotland. That's a complete falsehood, but there we are. Whenever I see some idea, whether it relates to history, science, religion or anything else, which can only be advanced by a system of deliberate deceit and deception, I am at once suspicious and ask myself what's going on and why it's necessary to lie to make people believe whatever the idea is. This is what I ask myself in the present case. Why is it necessary to tell so many flagrant lies in order to persuade us that a diverse society is beneficial to us, more advantageous, in fact, than the homogenous society which once we had in this country. 